So hello and welcome to uh, Beyond the uh, Drones Camera Specs webinar. I'm Jason Tillman, as uh, Laura noted, Product Marketing Director here over at Skydio, and I'm joined by Riot Khan, Product uh, Manager focused on drone cameras and sensors, as well as Russell Bondi, Senior Image, uh, Image Engineering Manager. And today, Riot will be walking us through the different types of cameras found on drones, their typical use cases, as well as the ones that we specifically chose for our newest drone, the Skydio X10, which just um, began shipping in November. Following this, Russell will be sharing an overview of the results from a recent drone camera comparison test uh, conducted by Imatest, and we'll share the report following the webinar uh, for those who really want to kind of dig into those details there. And uh, much like what was referred to earlier throughout the webinar, feel free to submit any sort of questions you have, and we'll answer as many of those as we can at the end. And with that, I'll hand things over to Riad to kick things off. Awesome. Thanks for the introduction, Jason. Uh, it's great to be here with all of you today to discuss something that we're, that's very important to all of us, camera systems and image quality. Based on what we know about the audience here today, many, if not all of you, are knowledgeable about drones, and we love that. Looking at camera specs, we can look at everything from a cell phone to a DSLR camera. The real question is, what are you going to be using it for? What are you going to do with your drone? And what are you looking to capture? Are you capturing wide, expansive shots? Uh, do you need precision temperature measurements? Today, I'm going to start by going over the use cases that we at Skydio have been heavily focused on with our customers, among others. And what's really important to us is how the cameras in our sensor packages perform in the situations that matter most to our customers. We ask ourselves what really matters. What combined set of capabilities give our customers what they need? So let's go over some typical scenarios or use cases. These include inspections and situational awareness. In developing X10 and our sensor packages, we've worked extensively with customers, partners, and others to ensure that the products that we're building meet your everyday needs, and that the sensors and technologies we've built meet the needs of those use cases. So typically for inspection missions, you're looking for structural issues such as cracks, loose bolts, corrosion, or even the general condition of drainage systems or waterproofing. This can be across a variety of scenarios, bridges, solar farms, distribution networks, and more. You might be using your data for photogrammetry or 2D orthomosaics, or for the mapping and modeling of crash scenes, for instance. There are a variety of cameras that are commonly used for these missions, and they can vary. Zoom cameras, thermal cameras, wide angle, low light. And sometimes for inspections, desired standoff distance isn't possible. For instance, maybe you're inspecting a utility pole that's surrounded by trees and foliage. Camera system versatility helps ensure that you're getting the captures you need in difficult situations like these. The goal here is combining high resolution imagery with the ability to capture the exact shot you need safely and often repeatedly. Now, as far as situational awareness goes, for situational awareness missions, you're looking for potential suspects, you're looking at crowd sizes and movements, missing persons or damage or obstructions after disasters. Cameras for these missions can vary as well and can be similar to those used for inspection zoom cameras, thermal cameras, wide angle, low light, but the specs themselves can differ and matter because they can be used in different ways. The goal here is combining the right balance of long range visibility, high resolution imagery, and real time streaming to give operators continuous visuals on areas and events that are being monitored. Now let's talk about the sensor packages on X10 and why we chose what we chose, and how these versatile sensor packages meet the various use cases that we've been discussing. Our VT300Z is currently live with customers, enabling them to capture exceptional imagery for their needs. It has a narrow camera, telephoto camera, and a radiometric thermal camera, and we'll go into detail on all of these in a little bit. Our VT300L will be shipping to customers soon, it has a one inch wide camera, a narrow camera, a radiometric thermal camera, and a flashlight to illuminate objects in low light situations. 
In selecting cameras and capabilities for these sensor packages, we worked closely with customers and partners alongside rigorous testing and validation in-house and in the field to ensure great performance. So let's go over the specifics. To start, both VT300Z and VT300L have the FLIR Boson Plus 640 radiometric thermal camera. When comparing to Skydio X2, we see significant improvements with this awesome module. We're seeing 2x thermal sensitivity, 4x resolution with the 640x512, and of course, we introduced the addition of radiometry, getting temperature measurements across the pixel array. Additionally, we do significant, a ton of work tuning for the best perform performance, going to the field, testing, retuning, personalizing that tuning to fit the use cases of our customers, and talking to customers throughout that process, which has led to the preset tunes that we have today, tailored to inspection and reconnaissance. We also know that some of our customers like to dial things in even further. So we've also recently launched a custom thermal mode, allowing customers to adjust gain, high tail, and low tail knobs if they want to adjust further. We know completing the mission on time is of utmost importance. So we made sure the sensor reliability matched expectations. Our Boson Plus camera has been qualified to challenging automotive, military, and aerospace standards for worry-free operation in the most demanding environments. And thinking back to use cases, there are many. For inspection, radiometric thermal cameras can be used for utilities and substations, on solar farms, and more. For situational awareness, thermal cameras help our customers identify people in cars, among others, for reconnaissance, search and rescue, and more. Now for radiometry, all 328,000 pixels are radiometrically calibrated. What that means to you, real-time visual feedback of scene temperature information and saving thermal images in the RJPEG format is embedded with temperature metadata. Customers familiar with FLIR products will greatly benefit with the RJPEG thermal image when used with FLIR Thermal Studio. As an example use case here of the inspection of a solar farm, the high temperature icon, the red H, is indicating that a single cell on the highlighted panel has a thermal anomaly, which may indicate a damaged or defective panel. And then after detecting, the pilot can further review the color or the electro-optical imagery to rule out any issues due to soiling. Now let's talk about our EO or electro-optical cameras or visual cameras, which together with thermal form the basis of our sensor packages. I want to start off by saying it's about combined performance. It's not just about each individual camera, but how they work together. For instance, we've worked carefully to select focal lengths and smooth transition points between them so that together the total range of each sensor package meets our customer's requirements. In addition, with our state-of-the-art quad bayer Sony sensors, we can optimize our tuning for both bright and low light situations and augment those low light scenarios with the flashlight on our VT300L. By partnering with Sony, we have access to exceptionally high quality sensors that allow us to keep our overall camera system small and light, taking advantage of significant recent advances in sensor technology. And then our world-class image quality team, including Russell, who you'll hear from later, partners with our customers directly alongside simulation and testing to ensure that we remain focused on the toughest requirements every step of the way. As an example, while developing VT300L, we visited bridges and critical infrastructure with our customers, capturing images, processing them in photogrammetry software, and further tuning and refining our systems. Overall, these just are not off-the-shelf products. They're fine-tuned for seamless operation and exceptional performance for our customers. Now digging into each camera, let's start with the 50 degree diagonal field of view narrow camera. With 64 megapixel resolution and a custom rectilinear lens, narrow is our versatile camera and a great all around choice for both inspection and situational awareness use cases, such as Overwatch for a law enforcement agency. This camera enables X10 to fly and focus from just one meter away, of course augmented by our leading obstacle avoidance, enabling high resolution, meaningful captures at a multitude of distances. 
Next, we have our 13 degree field of view telecamera or telephoto. This is an extremely compact telephoto lens, ideal for punching in on detail in almost any condition. When used in combination and as a transition from the narrow camera in our VT300Z sensor package, it's a great choice for situational awareness as well as inspections where you are unable to get close. Imagine a scenario where a drone providing overwatch with the narrow camera needs to zoom in and identify, for instance, a vehicle license plate from 600 feet away. With the VT300Z, the user can zoom in seamlessly from narrow through tele to get that information that they need. Alternately, perhaps you're doing inspections of utility poles, as mentioned earlier, surrounded by vegetation and you can't get close. Both the narrow and tele lenses could be well suited to get this shot from far away. Finally, with the VT300L that's coming soon, we're introducing the one inch wide camera used in, in conjunction with the narrow and the thermal and replacing the tele camera that you would find on the VT300Z. With its 93 degree field of view, wide is well suited to capture large scenes close up in high detail, even in very low light. It has vastly improved sensitivity compared to previous generation cameras and it's great for inspection use cases while still being a great, versatile, all-around camera. Recall that the VT300L also has an LED flashlight for effective illumination of objects up to three meters away. Alongside the one-inch wide and narrow cameras, this further enables inspections in low-light situations, such as inspecting the shadowed underside of a bridge. Once again, it's not just about each individual camera, but how they work together in sensor packages that we've thoughtfully designed to meet a variety of use cases. In addition to our thermal and EO cameras, our image signal processing, or ISP, and image quality, or IQ, the tuning plays a significant role. Throwing the right cameras into a sensor package is one thing, but there is an enormous amount of work that happens after that, our ISP. This is another area where Skydio separates ourselves from our competitors. Fine tuning and pixel peeping to get accurate color, as well as balancing denoising and keeping the correct amount of detail. Capturing images is one thing, but processing can play a substantial role in refining the capture data's white balance, exposure, noise correction, and color correction. And with that in mind, we've partnered with Qualcomm to use one of their most advanced image signal processors. Bringing everything together you can have confidence that you will get the photos and videos needed to get your job done without having to worry about your camera. Now, when it comes to capturing the very best aerial data, the cameras themselves are only a portion of the equation. There are other critical factors that we considered in building the X10, including, for instance, lighting. This influences clarity, depth, and texture in your images. With proper lighting, you can reduce noise and graininess. And with that in mind, we added an LED flashlight to the VT300L sensor package. Next, we have proximity. The greatest cameras available are of limited use if you can't access the areas you need to conduct your missions in complex environments, such as, for instance, an urban canyon. The X10 can handle environments where others simply can't go. Next, we have autonomy. Navigating and capturing the right data can become exceedingly complex. Enabling the X10 to autonomously navigate complex, obstacle-rich environments and even automate challenging missions enables even minimally trained users to complete missions just as well as their veteran pilot peers. And finally, connectivity. Skydio X10 can be flown both from your controller and remotely with remote flight deck allowing operators to fly wherever they need. With all that said, we know that many of you will be focused on third-party validation and metrics, so let's share that with you today. Today, we're giving a preview into how these cameras have been performing with a focus on our VT300Z sensor package and with plans to have a later report for the VT300L. Now I'm going to hand it over to Russell to go over that with you. Yeah, thanks, Ryan. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Russell Bondi. I lead the image quality team here at Skydio. You know, I feel really fortunate to be the one to, to present this um, this amount of work that's gone into this. 
you know, we were really excited to, to partner up with Imatest here and see if they wanted to take on this project, um, and they did. And so I'm going to talk you through the kind of the main components of the, the image stack here, um, sharpness, color accuracy, noise ratios, uh, and then dynamic range. Um, and I'll, this is just a slider overview of the different camera systems here that, uh, that we, we measured today. Um, and so <clears throat> like Ray had talked over, we have our full res 64 megapixel narrow camera, um, our telephoto that comes in at 48 megapixel. Um, then we did the Mavic 3, we did the, the M30, and then we did the Autel 4T. Um, and the way we kind of grouped these up, where we, we chose the field of view of the M3E to match our narrow camera for this, and we, we actually doubled the distance of the narrow camera so the field of view match. So everything for the M3E is captured at one meter, and everything for our narrow camera is captured at two for all these tests. Um, and then luckily, the, the, our tele camera matched the specs of the 4T and the, the M30 pretty well, so we me measured those at five meters um, across the board. So, like I said, really, really excited that Imatest took on this project. They're, they're super well known in the in the camera industry um, for, for you know for for technology, for software that helps like analyze images and cameras and whatnot, and then also the the hardware for for testing. Like this chart right behind me is is a is an image in, or is an Imatest chart. Um, moving forward, um, so the first block of this, um, which is a really important block, is is sharpness, right? We want our cameras to be sharp. You know, the difference between uh, getting sharpness right the first time stops us from having to go back and recapture the image. Um, and sharpness is a difficult thing because it's not just the lens. You know, we often think like, oh, this lens isn't sharp. Um, it could be the lens. It, it could be the, the sensor behind it. It could be just not having enough pixels on the target. Um, it could be your kind of balance between noise and denoise, you know, if you if you're really adverse to noise, you might denoise too much, and that that eats into your sharpness. Um, could be your autofocus failing. There's a lot of factors that that contribute to sharpness, and getting them all right in an image is really important. So you can see here on the left, this like example image, that that dial, that gauge is super sharp. We're getting the information we need out of that. We might not be able to read the number. It might send someone back out to the field to recapture that image. So at Skydio, our goal is to just do this once, do it right. Um, and speaking about sharpness, we're going to go into the next slide here, and there's going to be some numbers. So I wanted to give you a little overview of how we get those numbers. Um, MTF is the measure of contrast, basically. So on the right side of the slide here, um, you can see these kind of descending um, frequencies. It's like bigger line charts or bigger uh, pairs at the top as they get smaller at the bottom. And so what MTF is doing is it's measuring the, the black and white. It's measuring how much gray is in between those. So at the top here, we have a really clear black line alongside a really clear white line. Um, so we're gonna have a really high amount of contrast there and our cameras should be able to, to measure that and say, hey, black is really well-defined, white is really well-defined. And then as we, we, we move down this, the, the frequency of those line pairs become closer together and you can see it becomes more gray. And so then we're measuring the amount of gray instead of the black and white. That's how we get these numbers. And I think it's, it's a super great test and, and we'll go into the slides and we want everything to match you know, we want our data to match what we see as well, like our objective numbers to match our subjective stuff. So we'll kind of bounce everything off. And the way Imatest did this was they gave us a number, but then they also gave us an image that goes alongside it, which I think is super valuable. Um, and so we'll go into the next slide and, and I'll, I'll talk you through it. So here's sharpness. Again, this is in daylight conditions. This is our uh, bright light here. Um, this is our narrow camera system. Uh, on the left, we have the X10 full res, which is scoring 5,000 line width per picture height. Um, we're happy with that score. It's a great score. Um, our bind mode is, is lower resolution, hence a lower score. Um, across the board, people are, are we're doing pretty well here. M3 East doing well as well. Um, and I think the cool part to look at here, which I love to see, is that our objective data matches what we see on the chart. So the 5,000 line pairs um, on the left of the full res if you look at the 50 foot mark and the 15.2 meter mark, that looks really sharp. It's the sharpest out of all of them. So we're excited to see again, our data match. And I think this is key for, for, for understanding, going out once, getting your data, getting clean data, and then moving forward. Um, and so the, the piece of this that, that makes a lot of sense to me um, is when we move into the low light capture. So this next slide is low light. And because our full res image is using our smaller pixel, we're collecting less light and so when we move into these low light scenes, the, scene, the, the MTF results are being more dominated by noise. 
um, which makes sense. So we're not seeing our full res still shine through even in low light conditions, which would kind of make you question whether the data was accurate. We're seeing our bind mode and we're seeing the M3E all of a sudden become on top of this, this score. And that makes sense based on the pixel size and how we collected and how we analyzed this data. So again, Imitest did a great job here. And we see our bin mode become a sharper image. If you look at the 50 foot and the 12 um, or at the 15.2 meters, they look sharper. That makes sense to us. Um, and then you can see our full res, the image looks a little noisy. The 50 meters looks a little softer, like that's like kind of physics and hardware standpoint. So this data in my mind, you know, is very valid and looks great. We're excited to see our bin mode stand out here. And I think, you know, it talks to, to the versatility of these sensors. Um, if you're in daylight and you're trying to capture high res information, our full res mode is gonna be great. And then if you're doing something in lower light, maybe you're on the underside of a bridge or just, you know, the light, the sun has set and you still gotta get some work done. The bin mode is gonna, you know, perform just really well in those low light conditions and, and allows us kind of to do the best of both worlds. Um, in our HDR, we make some 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 moves here to, to really stretch the dynamic range. So we expect a little loss there as well. And so it makes sense. Um, and then we're looking at our, our, our tele system here. Again, this trend is that, you know, we'd expect based on the hardware configurations that the X10 full res should be the highest here. It's a 48 megapixel system. Um, we're excited that, that again, the, the, 30, the 3000 line widths per picture height is the highest. The 50 looks really great. You know, across the board, everyone kind of has differing issues. Um, you can see the Autel 4T looking really soft here. Um, and a lot of like, looks like denoise. We'll, we'll talk about that in a little bit. But I think this test is super valuable. And, you know, as we move forward with Imitest, the, the way these, these were set up is that we can repeat these tests. So maybe we make a bunch of software changes to our narrow camera um, down the line. We can then send it back to Imitest, be benchmarked again, added into this stack, super valuable. Um, Flexible. Um, in the low light, again, we'd really like to see this flip. All of a sudden, the quarter res standard, our bend mode um, up, up on top. And you can see, like I mentioned before, uh, as you get into lower light, um, maybe your lens is great and your sensor is great, but your autofocus algorithm starts to struggle, starts hard, having a hard time finding the difference in the contrast. Um, that's something we faced a lot with some of the DJI products, was just in the low light, all of a sudden, focus became problematic. And so you can see, uh, the M30, even though it has similar pixels to, to what we're using, it's falling short again to our bend mode. Um, so just, just other things to think about when you look at this data. And another piece of this is the Autel um, looks, it's scoring pretty well here, but I would say, argue that the M30 looks better. Um, but one thing you can note is that the Autel, if you look at the D, it has this kind of white halo around it. Um, and so essentially, like I mentioned before, we're measuring the difference between the, the black and white. And so if you, you kind of over sharpen the image, it creates this halo artifact, and then you kind of fool the algorithm. So another reason that it's really nice that Imitest paired the images is that you can see like, hey, you know, they're clearly like really soft, can't read the 50, but they're scoring high. Why is that? And then if you, you look into it a little further, you're like, oh, they've like, you know, artificially made a wedge. So you kind of trick the system. So another reason why it's really important to look at your objective numbers and then also look at it side by side with your subjective images. So moving on here, um, I'm talking about sharpness, why we think it's so important. Uh, again, we, we wanna understand, we want you guys to go out and no matter what your use case is, we really want you to capture your data and do it just once, understand it and go home and ana analyze it in a way that's super useful. So we're zooming in here on our narrow camera Oh, there's a crack. We're, what, what's going on? Let's take another look. The more we punch in, we discern there's a 0.1 millimeter crack here. We're happy that we can see that. It's a basically, you know, when you're looking at a crack, you're basically looking at a, a line pair in a sense, right? The black side is the crack and the, the wall is the white. We want to make sure that we have enough pixels there, sharp pixels, and that our autofocus did a good job of, of making that stand out to us and choosing the right, the right piece of information to focus on. So the sharpness, you know, it's a big piece of it. Again, if you're thinking about the, the MTF, like a license plate is like the perfect example, right? Like you have a, a black letter against a white plate. We got to make sure that that line between the letter and the plate is really sharp. We want to make sure we have good contrast there. So this again for our tele system is super important. It, it's important across all of our camera systems. We want them to be sharp. Um, we want to kind of thread the needle of, of noise to sharpness, um, which we'll talk about more in a few, in a few slides. 
Um, these slides I'm going to skip. So we're going to color accuracy. Um, this is uh, a really um, a really important piece to this the whole camera system. Is you know everybody has different use cases. Color accuracy might be super important to some and, and less important to others, but you know, the way I think about it is I, I don't want someone to go out and be trying to recognize a, a hazard hazmat placard and, and get the color wrong or, you know, there's a lot of reasons why you'd want this to be really accurate. So for this camera program, we really prioritized having correct colors in all lighting conditions, um, which is a difficult thing to do. Um, and we, we took on that challenge. I think we've done a good job. I'm excited to share the data and just a little background again on how this one is calculated. What you see here is a color checker. Um, and what we do is we, we capture the color checker in different lighting conditions, and the color checker has a known value for every single patch that's on it. And then what we do is we, we then measure that known value against what our camera reproduced, and the delta between them is how we come up with like how accurate our color systems are. So moving forward, um, we measure the delta E. This is measuring all the patches on the chart here, um, and this is daylight. Cameras are really, you know, daylight's a... a Kind of like the SFR, it's an easy kind of target. We really tune towards it because a lot of our customers are using daylight scenes, um, and everyone's scoring great here. You know, delta E at a six is fantastic. That means the colors are being reproduced well. Um, it's pretty simple. It's when we get into low light and kind of mixed light conditions that all of a sudden we have a hard time kind of recognizing. Oh, is that white or is that green? Um, so as we move into the low light here, you can see that, that the colors change. The white balance shifts a little bit, um, and so this is a low light scene and Skydio's cameras across the board, you can see that that white of the eye chart is still really white. So you'd be out capturing this information. You'd know what you're getting. The M3E here starts to suffer a little bit. Their colors start to shift. The white turns a little more yellow. Uh, you know, it's just something to note. And, uh, you know, Delta E numbers and that stuff's a little bit hard. I think, again, like it's really, it's really nice to have these images that go alongside it because it, it just speaks to itself. Like here, here's a great set of data. Here's how these images capture. This is what we're, we're after. Um, here we go, moving into the tele system. Uh, you can see here, everyone's doing a pretty good job. The Autel has kind of a, a purple tint to it, which is being picked up. They're scoring 11, whereas everyone else is in the low numbers. Um, I think this is, this is daylight again. These numbers are all like very low. Only one that's a little bit elevated is the, the Autel. And then going into lower light, um, you can see here, this system again is, is performing well, you know, we, since we're measuring across all the different color patches, the numbers can change a little bit, but we're pretty happy like with this subjective review here, you're like, our whites are looking white, our greens are looking green. The Autel and, and the M3E have shifted towards being warmer and, and kind of not you know, representing each color exactly as it would be on in, in the scene. And so we focused on this. We're really happy how it came out. We're really happy that Imatest, again, paired images with numbers, just makes it really simple for us to step through and see this. Um, so that's that's fantastic. And then why color matters. We want you guys to go out and, and to, to, to capture your images and understand like, hey, this rust is like, you know, more advanced or the next thing, you know, we really want everything to be very natural as like concrete is, like, you know, it's not yellow, it's actually gray, things like that. So we're, we're pretty happy with with how things have gone. And then the next big piece here, um, I think sharpness and noise are kind of the the main pieces to a system. And and they kind of fight each other when we're when we're tuning, right? Like we really want everything to be sharp, but we don't want any noise to be in the scene. And so as we remove that noise, there's a really fine line. So noise um, to a camera system and to an ISP looks it's a lot like detail. A noise, we accidentally take away detail. Um, so Skydio, you know, on our ISP side, we spent a lot of time kind of pixel peeping and fine tuning that trade off. We, we wanted to remove as much noise as possible, but we definitely didn't want to remove any detail because the details where the data is and we want um, all our customers to go out and capture everything and have as much detail um, as possible. And, and even like a little bit of noise, I think is, is okay to look through. Um, we definitely didn't want that kind of smoothing artifact to take place um, and then remove any of the information that, that is key to, to getting the job done. So we're doing signal to noise here. Here's daylight. Um, again, the, the paradigm between um, our full res and our quarter res uh, in sharpness that we saw should should kind of match here as well. Like the smaller pixel of the full res um, is going to have a harder time collecting light. There's going to be more noise in that. But then when we double that pixel size, we're able to collect way more light. The sensitivity of the sensor goes way up. 
and we can perform a lot better. So we'd expect these numbers to, to flip like we saw in the, in the SFR or the MTF data. <clears throat> so here, daylight, everybody's doing really well. The full res is a little bit lower. It's a much smaller pixel than the M3E and our, even our, our, our quarter res. Um, and then we step forward and you can see again, like looking at the subjective images, the full res looks noisy, the number's low, our bind is, is doing better here, our HDR is doing better, and the M3E, which has a big, big pixel, this are just physics. Um, and so we're, we're, again, this kind of just proves out that this data is very, very well captured and, and documented. So we're, we're happy to, to kind of see this, we're happy to see our bin mode do better, again, leads towards us being like, you know, our camera's versatile. You're in full res, you're in good light, you should be using full res mode. There's low noise there to begin with. You can capture ton data, you can expedite, things can be faster. Um, but then you get into these tricky situations. It's nice to be able to have this other mode that captures even more light, the sensor becomes more sensitive um, and you can reduce that noise footprint. Looking at our um, tele mode here across the board, um, this is another one that's a little bit tricky just because Autel uh, is scoring the highest here. But if you look at what they're doing, I, I spoke to it just a, a minute ago, it, it's a balance of noise reduction to detail. Um, and they went really heavy, heavily handed towards noise reduction, like they're at 51 dBs, which is significantly higher than anyone else. But if you look at the subjective image, you can hardly read the 10, right? They, they've removed so much noise that they're now eating into their detail, um, which is not something we, we're trying to do. Um, I think if you're in a consumer product and you don't want noise to be seen, it makes sense. But really, if you're in the inspection and enterprise use case um, or any use case in kind of the enterprise wheelhouse, you want that information. So again, this is this is the daylight condition. Everyone's measuring roughly the same here. Um, you know, besides Autel, which again, you know, they're they're punching up that noise reduction and, and hurting themselves a little bit. Um, then we get into the the low light. You can see the different camera systems perform differently. Our full res versus uh, the the DJI M30 full res, they start to suffer where the bin modes um, start to do a little better. So we're happy to see again that the Autel's smoothing, the 10 has basically disappeared. Um, our X10 quarter res uh, is, is doing well here. We're excited to see that. And then our HDR there looks really good here, which is great. You know, the tele system is, is, is an impressive system. Um, and kind of speaking towards why we think this is important and why you might want to switch modes in different scenes. Like here's an example of a, a really dark area. Um, and even some parts of the scene, this scene are, are even darker than the others. So on the right side here, it's dominated by this kind of chroma noise and all the information along that wall is then hidden, right? That's our full res on the right. You're not getting a ton of noise. And then you switch over to our, our bend mode and all of a sudden you're revealing this entire concrete wall. You're able to then see more information. You're able to get the job done. So it's super nice to kind of have both in the wheelhouse for the top side of this bridge. Let's say you were, you know, you're doing things quickly, you're in full res, and then you're like, hey man, we need a little more light down here. Boom, we switch modes. It's super powerful um, and, and dynamic. Moving on to dynamic range. I love dynamic range. I think it's like one of the coolest metrics. I also just love how a, a wide dynamic range looks. Um, this really isn't, you know, the typical uh, inspection shot, but I, I really like the way this looks. Um, this is a shot near our headquarters. Um, so you can see that our system here uh, is keeping the sky. On the right, we have our HDR system. On the left, we have our full res. Um, the shadows are, are kind of lost. There's information there that's being lost. Um, and typically, if you were to expose the shadows correctly, then the sky would become overexposed, right? You'd have to like give up something in order to get something else. But with HDR, the goal is to be able to stretch that, keep the highlights like we did here, but also boost the shadows. Um, so the skyline looks the same, but all of a sudden, all that information down in that lower region is now lifted. We can see it, super powerful example. Um, and the way we're doing this with the image test chart here on the right is the, starting at the bottom, there's these there's squares that go all the way up, right? And so we, we measure the first square on this chart in the dark region that we actually get some information that's not completely clipped. We note that down, then we start at the top and we go the other direction. The first square there is totally overexposed. There's no information there. The next one, we get some information and then how many squares are, are in between those two is how we determine the dynamic range. You'll see this chart a lot in the, in the following slides. That's just kind of the, the background of how we get it done. Um, so here is our dynamic range. Um, 
we're pretty excited about these results. The one thing I will add is that this test, uh, the way it's set up is the, the chart is a small portion of the field of view and the rest of it is all black. Um, it's kind of built on an older technology of dynamic range. The, the sensor we use, which Ryad spoke to earlier, is a quad bayer sensor. So it has a feature called quad bayer HDR. And the way that works is it actually takes multiple exposures across multiple pixels, pixels and then fuses those together. So it's, it's essentially doing kind of the old school HDR where you take an underexposed, a correctly exposed, and then an overexposed to get all the different parts of the scene. And then in post-processing, you fuse those together. You get a really wide dynamic range. We're doing that in real time at an image and we're, we're leveraging different pixels to do that. So the cool part of that is that we can really stretch dynamic range. The other part is that it's, it's, it's a dynamic really trigger unless it's needed. So if you're in a very flat scene, we're gonna expose all the pixels exactly the same and only turn on this kind of algorithm when, when the scene demands or requires a stretch. Um, and so our HDR didn't exactly trigger in this scene, which we really would have liked to, but it's something we've tuned for like kind of real world case, cases and less tuned for um, you know, test environments or, or lab environments. So luckily our, our tele system was a narrow field of view. And so with a narrow field of view, this did trigger. And so we'd expect the exact same performance with our narrow camera as we would with our tele because they leverage a very similar pixel and a very similar technology. So that being said, we've also tuned our, our standard mode to have a really wide dynamic range as well because we think that's a key part for getting jobs done. We've exposed things lower and then we kind of boost using tone mapping to stretch it. So our, our full res and our bin mode have a really a, like large amount of dynamic range we think for like a standard system. Um, we're seeing here that HDR is scoring the worst, which is just confusing. But again, it's because the, the test system is, doesn't really match our technology. Um, M3E has a, a really big pixel and they do well here. You know, that's just the way it is. Um, and then if we go to our telephoto, this one is where our system did trigger and we're really happy to see the results. Again, for telephoto and for narrow, um, we stretch the dynamic range a huge amount just in processing in the ISP side. So we pulled, uh, we pulled the dynamic range with tone mapping and extremers, but then if you see our HDR mode, once we trigger the dynamic HDR, we're getting huge numbers there, really stretching the dynamic range. That means you're on the underside of a bridge and you care about what's behind you. Uh, you can expose the sky correctly and maybe you know a piece of the facade. And then you're also getting all the detail on the underside by stretching the dynamic range. Like it, it's just a really cool mode to get things done. Um, and I, I think it's a, a very powerful tool and I'm happy that it, it got a showcase here. And I, I think that the narrow camera would do the exact same thing if we just got it to trigger and we've seen it on our side. Um, but you know, as we go forward with Imitest, we'll, we'll work on this type of stuff um, and other camera systems. Yeah, so that's dynamic range. Um, here's a really cool example of it. I think again, you know, noise and sharpness are, are key, but also being able to do everything in just one shot, kind of making this user-friendly mode is super exciting. So in the background here, the sky looks very similar. We've exposed that similarly, but in the foreground, that pipe there, there you can see, um, I don't know how well it comes across on the link, but there's actually text stamped in at the bottom of the pipe, which is totally lost on the far side, uh, on the left side, and then there on the right side. Um, and I think that kind of information is like, hey, we have this one mode, it's super versatile. It allows us to get you know the, the shadows, the bright areas, it's, it's super cool and you know the game name of the game is, is getting the data getting it once and then getting uh, back to to the shop or wherever you need to be um, so uh, I think uh, I think that wraps up what I was going to talk about I'm super happy that Imatest was able to take this project on um, and uh, you know a cool part of this is they've done a good job having a controlled environment so we can continue to add you know we, we haven't stopped uh, you know making changes to our, our narrow camera our tele camera our HDR algorithm, lots of stuff has changed. So we can send that back, get it remeasured. Our L gimbal can be part of this. Um, you know, as new products come out, we have the ability to benchmark them. It's really nice for, for us on the engineering side to see how things are progressing and you know, the trade-offs being made. And then I also think it's really nice for the customers to understand, you know, oh, this camera system does really well in here. Oh, this mode does this. It kind of gives you insight into how the cameras are working and allows you for your use case to, to kind of prioritize what you want most and, and gives you insight into how our modes work. Um, so again, I'm, I'm super happy and I'll, uh, I'll, I'll pass it back to Jason to, to take it across the finish line. 
Thank you very much, uh, Russell and Ryad. I really appreciate that. And Laura, it looks like we have a few questions inside here. Do you want to start? Uh, yes. Yeah, so as a reminder, if you have a question to please submit them in the Q&A box and we'll do our best to get to as many as possible. So we have a question. Uh, Russell's measurement session was very interesting. Where can we find a way to obtain the different values indicated under the parts of the images being compared? Is it possible to have the setup with the test condition, conditions and the information to correctly set the parameters of the various various imatest measurement mo modules by email or at a later time. Yeah, um, so this was just kind of a summary of a, a large body of work they did for us, um, and we that that link is available, and can you can download their larger project. You can read through the kind of the test conditions, how tests were set up. They did a great job of documenting kind of every step of the way. Um, it's just kind of a, it's a denser read, like we wouldn't want to read through that during a, a webinar. It's more of like, hey, I just gave you the, the touch points, the high level stuff, um, but absolutely recommend people go over and download that and, and take a deep dive into that, um, that document. It's super powerful. And just as a side note to that, um, we actually have, if you go to the skydio.com slash blog, we actually have a blog post that actually summarizes much of what Russell shared here today, as well as a link to that much more in depth Imatest report so highly recommend that. And we'll also work to see about sending that out after this uh, after this webinar. Excellent, thank you. Uh, we have a question here. How does the camera on the Skydio 2 Plus compare? Um, yeah, that's a great question. Uh, you know, we didn't really think about it because we're kind of thinking about this generation and, and the competition around it. But having the, the S2 product also measured by the Imatest team seems like something super valuable. Um, the S2, it, you know, we're not going to knock it. You know, I worked on that camera as well. It, it's a great camera system. Um, but some of the things that limit it is it's, it's resolution. I know we, we heard from customers, we want higher resolution. So that's why our 64, 48 and 50 megapixels are kind of answering that. But again, the S2 is, is a really powerful camera system. It'll do a good job with color rate reproduction. You know, it's sharp up to its kind of megapixel limits. It, it's a really good camera system. We just kind of upped the bar again. We went to you know newer sensors. We went to higher resolution, um, things like autofocus. There's additional capabilities, additional algorithms built into the new cameras. But the S2 is still a, a workhorse um, and should you know be used if if it fits your criteria. Great, thank you. Um, we have a next question here. Will Skydio 3D scan work with the thermal Boson Plus payload along with the RGB and provide appropriate stereo overlap? Yeah, I can take that one. Um, so the, the answer is that the X10 3D scan, in addition to capturing both, uh, in addition to capturing the RGB images, the, the color images, um, you also have the option to capture thermal uh, JPEG files and RJPEG files during that scan. Um, through the user interface, when you're setting the scan up, it will calculate the corresponding overlap and side lap for the thermal images based on the overlap and side lap settings that you have for the RGB color images um, that are provided by the user. Thank you. Let's see here. Our next question, uh, will the Imitus testing en encompass uh, the VT300-L? Yeah, yeah, I can take that. Um, absolutely. I, I mean, w we plan to work with them. Based on where we were in the development cycle, it didn't make sense. The the VT300L was was really early, and so measuring it, you know, before you've had a chance to tune it, you know, just isn't isn't really a good idea. So now that we're, we're getting closer to to getting that out the door, I absolutely would love to to send that over to Imatest. And like I mentioned before, the way they've set up these tests is it's not like we need to test everything again. Everything's documented. We use the same light sources. We use the same distances. And so we can just add one more camera into that system and then get that data out of it, add it to this larger database. And I, I think it's super powerful. Um, we'll do that for the L, the, the one inch wide, um, any cameras that come out of Skydio, I, I plan to kind of have them benchmarked against our, our previous generation and then also the, the latest and greatest competition. Thank you. Uh, let's see, our next question, with the sensor packages being upgradable, are there plans for additional ones beyond the ones shared today? 
Uh, yeah, happy to, happy to answer that one. So um, it's a great question. Currently, our plan, we are, we are looking at building additional sensor packages for X10. Um, just in general, the platform is modular. The sensor packages are upgradable. So we're always looking at new cameras, technologies, capabilities, how they can work together. Um, and we've been talking with customers to understand what problems they need to solve and what we could build to meet their use cases. Thank you. Our next question, what countries are the X10 available in? I can answer that one. Um, so right now, the X10 is available in both the US and Japan, even though we're planning to release to much of the Commonwealth in the foreseeable. All right, this question's a bit of a general question, so I'm not sure who wants to take this. Um, this might be for um, more for Russell, but what are some of the major challenges you were faced with and how did you solve them? Um, yeah, I, I'll take that. Uh, I think one of the major challenges we were faced with was was tuning our autofocus to, to really, you know, prioritize the correct um, things in the scene. Uh, so, you know, autofocus is a tricky thing. And so at first we were, we were working with it and it was prioritizing kind of the background too much. Um, and then we enabled some additional algorithms, which allowed us to prioritize the foreground and, and really, you know, help our users like select the right object without having to touch the screen. You know, you don't want to always be tapping and whatnot. So we've, we've enabled some additional layers there that allow us to prioritize the correct things, allow focus to be a little bit smarter, to, to choose what we think our, our operator is really looking at versus like, you know, what might be the the have the highest high, highest con contrast in this. Definitely think autofocus was a challenge and I'm, I'm really happy where uh, where we are today with it because we did make a lot of progress throughout the, the project. Thank you. Um, you said that the camera automatically switches between standard and HDR. Is that correct? And if so, can you tell us on what basis it is done? So the camera doesn't automatically switch between the modes. What happens is the exposures will change. So if the scene does not require a, uh, a multiple exposures, because multiple exposures means you're using different gains and different exposure times. So you wouldn't want to introduce like more noise in your scene if you didn't need it. Um, so the idea is if you're, you're capturing kind of, you know, something that's low dynamic range, we'll just use one exposure time and one, um, one gain level for the entire scene, no additional noise needed. And then when you want to get into a, a high dynamic range scene, like a bridge, our pixels will automatically, it'll detect that, that like, Hey, th we're, we're, we're not able, we're not getting any information here. We're going to increase our gain. We're going to lengthen our exposure time, right. To, to bring out these shadows. So we won't switch between the modes. Our HDR mode is a dynamic HDR, which allows us to, to switch intelligently between using one exposure across the entire field of view or multiple exposures, just to clarify that, yeah. 